I'm delighted to say that my new book on Sultan Khan, the chess legend, has just been published by New in Chess. Sultan Khan was born in India, grew up in India, and then in his early 20s, he came to London in 1929. And after just a few months, he won the British Championship, or as they hastily renamed it, the Chess Championship of the British Empire. Sultan Khan repeated that victory in the British Championship in 1932, 1933. And during that time, he played some of the leading players in the world, Alikin, Capablanca and many others. And then at the end of 1933, he returned to India and very little was heard of him again. So a very mysterious player. And I became fascinated by his story a few years ago, and I've been researching and writing over the past few years. There you go, I kept that under my hat. And the result is this book. If you've heard of Sultan Khan, it might be for a, a famous victory over Capablanca in the Hastings tournament um, in 1930 or 1930, 1931, the tournament stretched over New Year. And I'd like to show you that game at maybe some later date. But what is very little known is that they'd faced each other a couple of years before. In fact, just after Sultan Khan arrived in London. So he, he arrived in London on the 26th of April, 1929. And two days later, they faced each faced each other in a simultaneous display. I mean, that is quite extraordinary. Of course, Capablanca was the superstar. He was giving the simultaneous display. Sultan Khan was allowed to play against him, which with hindsight is extraordinary, but no one really knew how strong Sultan Khan was. He'd never faced any Western opposition. He'd played very little chess, Western chess in India, he was the All India champion, but remember, he'd only learnt the Western game three years before he grew up playing an Indian form of the game. So no one was really sure how good he was in Western chess. Anyway, in my research, I turned up this game that was played in this simultaneous display. So here we go, Capablanca, as usual, the simul giver with the white piece pieces. And it's an orthodox start so far, Queen's Gambit declined. And here, Khan plays a6, so already we can see he's playing in a slightly unorthodox way. And this was one of his specialities, playing these little sh pawn moves at the side of the board. Of course, this kind of thing is seen quite a lot in Queen's Gambit positions, where you take here and then advance the pawn to b5. In this position, it's slightly unusual. Capablanca avoided the exchange on c4 by taking on d5. So now we've got a quite a typical exchange variation position. And here, if black plays knight d7 and then castles, it's a pretty normal position. But Khan played bishop b6 which isn't that great. He, he wasn't really familiar with Western openings and he improvised a lot of the time. And Capablanca really puts his finger on the problem that this knight wants to come to f4 to attack the bishop. And here, Khan's next move is really quite dubious. He played the pawn to c5, opening up the position straight away with his king in the middle. And this really shows his inexperience. You have to remember that Khan grew up playing a form of the game where castling or a Western form of castling uh, didn't exist in the Indian game. And he was used to playing with his king in the middle. But really, Capablanca exposes the weakness in, in Khan's opening play here because there's already enormous pressure on this pawn on d5. And in fact, if black castled, then it would be possible to take this because of a discover check on h7. So Khan was forced to play g5 to avoid losing material, but already 
that looks very weakening. And here again, castles is possible, perhaps the best move. But he played king e7. Remember, he was quite comfortable playing with his king in the middle of the board. Well, Capablanca must have thought that he was on for a quick victory here and started to open up the position with Black's king still in the middle. And knight e2 is, is, looks pretty good, perhaps coming into d4. Um, and also, you know, there's a pin here on the c file. But now, Sultan Khan starts to hit back, knight g4, hitting that pawn on e3. But Capablanca just goes for it now. He senses that Black's king is perilously placed. So he gives up the pawn on e3. And, well, frankly, it does look pretty dubious for Black because the lines are opening and all white's pieces are in play. I mean, really, it's very, very dangerous. Pawn takes pawn. So, well, at least Khan has grabbed some material, but still, it's looking pretty dubious. And with this next move, Queen h5, you have to feel the writing is on the wall. If Knight takes Rook on f1, then actually Knight takes pawn is, is a winning move. It just destroys Black's position in the middle and, and well, basic variation, but that, that is checkmate. But after Queen h5, this is where Khan really showed that he had something, he had real talent, because he starts to play some excellent defensive moves. First of all, rook f8, covering the f7 square. So a very important move. Queen g6 still looks really nasty, attacking the pawn on e6. But Khan realizes that, well, he can scrape out of this. If he goes back with the rook, this would actually be disastrous. Bishop a6 is very good for white. But instead he played queen b6. Excellent move. Creating threats of his own. Ditches the pawn on e6. But in fact the king is relatively safe on c7. And now you can see we have a complete quagmire of a position on the board. There are pieces attacked here. The white's king is on g1, on the same line as the queen. Uh, the king has slipped away and still might have a chance to even to, to get further. I know that the bishop is on priest here, but um, there, you know, there's a chance for the king to slip, slip further away. There's also potential to attack here. I mean, perhaps you'd like to think what you would play with white in this position. But remember, you're facing over 30 other players. You're zipping around, having to play incredibly quickly, and suddenly you've just got a mess on the board. This was not Capablanca's kind of position. He liked the smooth, strategic paths where he could play clear plans. He didn't like a mess like this. I mean, one option is to take on c6, and then to play rook f2, and that stops Black taking anything. But actually, Black has counterplay here. This pawn is under fire. Black suddenly Black's pieces are actually very well coordinated. So I can understand why he didn't want to do that. And there's no real attack on Black's king either. Well, what are the other options? Um, Bishop f6 is probably a decent move because that protects the knight. But then the rook comes across and black is also okay in this position. So what did Capablanca play? Incredibly, he took the pawn on d5. He must have imagined he was still in for the kill, but unfortunately he'd forgotten about the backward knight move. He blundered his queen and resigned immediately, of course. So Sultan Khan actually defeated Capablanca way before that famous game at Hastings. Um, now, it's only a simul. It's only a simul game. I appreciate that. But still, I think historically it has great significance. 
but also it does show something about Sultan Khan's play that he was to demonstrate throughout his chess career, which was his extraordinary tenacity. He often got into problems in the opening, but somehow with his concentration and determination, he managed to pull through. And that's exactly what happened in this game here. So if you're interested in chess history, if you're interested in extraordinary stories about the, the, the leading players of the, of the day, like Capablanca, like Aliakin, and many others, if you're interested in finding out more about a true chess genius, Sultan Khan, then this is the book for you, available directly from newinchess.com, but also from Amazon as well. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for watching.